Almighty God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be faithful and pleasing to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So uh, this past summer was the first summer in, since 1999 that I wasn't on a youth mission trip. So almost 20 years straight, I've been on youth mission trips, and I, I think the number was approaching somewhere around 48, 49 total trips, usually two to three each summer and plus more. And this summer was one of those, and so it's kind of hard for me because I, I love it. I love working with my hands. I love the tools. I love all that I got to do with that. And, but I also have a, a ton of stories. And one of my favorite stories was, was a, a, a trip that I had about five or six years ago. And we, we were, what we were doing is we were getting ready to, to uh, 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 if you remember Bastrop a while back, you had some fires that went through it. And our, uh, the church I was leading, we took several groups of students, both college, high school, and, and junior high, there to do some work to clear out. And we went to this one house where the house had already been completely gutted. And what we were going to be putting in was subfloor. And so I, I go and I start to, to, we start to unload tools and unload the material to go put the subfloor in the house. And as we're doing it, I have several students with me of varying different, you know, you know, experience. And one young lady, she, she, she's super eager. She's excited. She wants to help, you know, use all the power tools and put the, the you know, screw down the floorboards and do all that kind of stuff. And so we start laying stuff down and she goes to the, to my toolbox and she goes, how does this one work? And she's looking and she's flipping it around and she's looking at the tool. And as she started, to, as she's starting to try to, to, to figure out where she would insert the, the driver portion of it and all that kind of stuff, I said, well, well that's a flashlight. <laughs> now, I'll be honest with you. It was one of those, you know, flashlights that had one of those heavy batteries and, you know, it looked very complicated, but it was still a flashlight. And, 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 and I realized something in that moment. I realized that sometimes uh, we, we have the tools available to us. But sometimes we don't understand what those tools are or how they work. They, they also sometimes get outdated, those tools do. And we don't use them anymore, and, and we have to re-look re look at new tools. So we're going to play a game real quick. And I know I'm going to have people being able to answer this because we have some people with wisdom. You like how I use that? And so you're going to be able to answer it, but what I want you to see about these tools is there's still something special about them. So, Chris, let's play this game. So we're going to start off, and we're going to look at this tool. This one's an easy one. Do you know what this tool is? An ice tray. Now, this is not a modern ice tray. This was an ice tray, but, but, it, but it's, it, it's very, that was an easy one, right? All right, so that was a softball. Let's go to the next one, another softball. What's this one? No? Yeah, a pot strainer. That's exactly what that is. All right, next one. No. Anybody that's been to a, a church potluck, you, might, you should be able to get this one. There you go, there you go. It's a condiment buffet tray. It was very common in churches to have these to set them out to, to, for serving. All right, so in that, let's do the next one. Egg boiler. You place your eggs in there. It's got the little, you flip it over, dump, dump it in the pot. Isn't that cool? All right, next one. Meat tenderizer. meat tenderizer. Now, does anybody have a meat tenderizer that looks like that in their kitchen? No, not really, right? They changed a bit. Um, next one. It's an ice shaver. Uh, did that make anybody crave Bahama Bucks? You know, you know, there you go. Yeah. Want some snow cones? Yeah, it's, a, it's an ice shaver. All right, let's look at the next one. Uh, no? It's a chop chopper. Yes, it's, 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 a, it's a kitchen chopper. It's for chopping, you know, it's got a little spring action, right? Let's look at the next one. Now, this is a set. Cheese slicer. Okay, one of them is a cheese slicer. There's two others. A cake slicer, yes. Which one's the cake slicer, Miss Lewis? That's the lowest. What's the what's the cake slicer? The one on the left. The big chocolate. All right. Actually, actually, that's a different one. It's the one in the middle of the cake slicer. Yeah. Oh. That's right. I just went, I, I just thought it was interesting. I did, I learned these this last week, so I'm not like special at this. Okay. And what about the one over here on 
My on on your left or yeah, your right. It's for sawing frozen foods. That's what it was for. So this is a fake light set. It was a cheese slicer, cake knife, and frozen food saw. All right, here's the last one. I, I really hope. Does anybody know this one? No. It's really weird. It's got all sorts of weird tools to it. Anybody got a guess? Oh, so close. It's an ice cream sandwich maker. Right? So, so why did I why did I bring up these tools? Why did I even mention these? Well, you know, here's the thing. All those tools, they, they still have a purpose today, right? They, they still have a purpose, but they're kind of outdated. You know, there's better tools out right now, right? Some of you might even have these in your kitchen, but you probably haven't used them in years because tools have gotten better. Not only that, but the, the what we purchase, what we use has changed in the supermarkets, right? So here's the question I want to ask, uh, ask you this. What does the church do? What does the church do? Grows your faith. You know, if, if I, you know, what, what's really interesting, if I ever ask somebody, what does the church do, or what does your church do, if I were to go up to Tom and go, hey, Chuck, Tom, what does your church do? I might get an answer, well, we have worship at 1030, we have Sunday school at 930, um, well, we have a CLC, that, that preschool, we, we have Bible studies, we, we do vacation Bible school, but we help at this SMU concession stand. We, oftentimes when you, somebody's asked what a church does, they tell you, they list activities. But what I want you to hear this morning is that what a church does is not the activities it engages in, but it's its mission or it's its purpose. That's what a church does. And so I know I have a, some professors and I know I have some former pastors in the Methodist church, so you don't get to answer. I want, the, I want laity to answer this one. What is the mission of the United Methodist Church? Thank you, Kathy. Make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. So each of those tools I showed you before, each of those tools, they had a purpose. But the tools have been updated. And those updates have made them more effective. And so maybe we need that. Maybe we need a little upgrade, right? Maybe we need to become more effective because our mission hasn't changed. I mean, how long, you know, I don't know, because I really don't. Maybe this is something I'm going to have to know before uh, ordination, but how long has this been the mission of the United Methodist Church? Pastor Lewis went like this. <laughs> Forever. Since 96. Since 96, at least. So. But it was, it's been in the book display forever, and, and, or for a long time. And so what I want us to hear is, this, is that it's, it's scriptural, our mission in the United Methodist Church. And so what we're going to do now is we're going to all turn to today's scripture in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28. And we're going to be reading verses 16 through 20 together. Okay? So go in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 28, verses 16 through 20. All right, so it says this. It says, Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountain where Jesus told them to go. When they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. Jesus came near and spoke to them. I've received all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, <laughs> baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. Look, I myself will be with you every day until the present age. Jesus asked his disciples, you know, I understand some of you doubt. Some of you still don't quite get this. But I've been given the authority to, to do a new thing here in this world. And I'm now passing that authority and purpose and mission on to you. And so Jesus tells them, go and make disciples baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. So I want to ask you a question for, for you to answer to yourself right now. 
Are we making disciples? Do we even know how? Are we using the correct tools? Are our models old for making disciples? Do they still work? And, and the answer I'm, I'm going to give to you, a, a simple answer is, yes, we are. And yes, some of those tools, they will work forever. But just because you have the tools doesn't mean you know how to use them, just like that young lady on, on that mission trip. And then just because we have the tools doesn't mean there isn't a better tool available. And so we're going to think about those, and we're going we're gonna to grow in that. So I want to start off very simple. What is a disciple? So let's look at what a disciple is. So there's two ways of, of looking at the word disciple. The word disciple, it can be understood as a noun, as someone who adheres to the teaching, teachings of another. Disciple can also be a verb, meaning to teach or to train. So I'll give you an example. Um, uh, Connor is a disciple of Jesus Christ. Or Connor disciples his friends at school. See, there's two different ways of using it, as a noun and as a verb. And so here's, let's, let's do some, let's do some exercise and exegetical study of, of this scripture that we presented here in the Gospel of Matthew. And so to do that, let, let's start with um, the, the uh, let's start with the Gospel of Matthew, and, and we're going to see that in our common translation, when you look at that, the translation we're using right now, the, and the NIV, the NRSV, and this, the Common English Bible, it's used as what? What is the word disciple they are used as? As a noun. My scripture, my, my, my version of scripture right here says to uh, that in, in verse 19, therefore go and make disciples. Now. Now the King James Version, or let's go back, that, that's a little too early. Sorry. The King James Version, and also the original Greek text of this, it's a verb. If you were to translate it correctly, it actually, in, in those translations, it says, therefore, go and disciple all nations. That's an interesting perspective to think about that. And I only say that because when I look at those terms and I, I think of it, does that really matter if we use it as a noun or a verb? Think about how that sounds. It's, it's kind of got a, a different kind of intention, in my opinion, when we, when we read it. Make disciples of all nations. Make disciples of all nations could be interpreted that our job is done when there are disciples. When all, when, I'm sorry. Make uh, disciples of all nations. Yes. Make disciples of all nations means our job could be interpreted that it's done when there's disciples in all nations. That's when it's a noun. But when it's used as a verb, disciple all nations. Is best interpreted as our job is done when all nations become disciples of Jesus Christ. So going back to our mission of the UMC, this makes even more sense to me. So when we look at that mission statement of the United States Church, can we go back to that one real quick, Chris? To make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world, that transformation of the world was added in, in our mission statement that's not quite in that, that uh, the, the scripture right there because we understand that the world will become transformed when we are being intentional about discipling everyone and not just saying oh well we did the best we could that our job we never stop until it's all done so it doesn't matter really honestly if we read it has make disciples of all nations or disciple all nations. What really matters is that we are diligently working at discipling all people with the knowledge of the good news of Jesus Christ. Do you understand that? Amen. That's, that's the key importance to this scripture. The, the key importance to our message is that we are being diligent about that. And so this past week I gave you homework. I gave you homework for those who were here last Sunday. And if you, if you weren't here last Sunday, you should still go do the homework. Um, if, you, if you forgot to do the homework, don't worry. I'm only taking 10 points off. I'll give you an incomplete until you turn it into me. But it's better than, than an incomplete. I, I, uh, Dr. Thom, do you do better than that? It's in the neighborhood of that. Okay. So uh, go home and do your homework after this. But I'm also going to give you more. 
So in our homework, I asked these questions. I asked, what do you think that, that Cornerstone United Methodist Church is doing? How well of a job do you think we've been doing? And I've had varying answers. And I've really been pleased because I've had over 30 people respond back to me on this. And, and, and the responses have come from, yeah, we're doing a, a, an okay job, but we could do more. To, yes, I think we're doing it all we can because of what resources we have. And to some people saying, absolutely not. We are just not doing anything. And what I did see, even though the answers were varying, is that everybody that had responded on the work recognized that there was work to be done here. And that the work could be done. And so we've asked the question, what is a disciple? And it's easy for me to say to somebody who, who asked me what a tool is when they're looking at it. But it's a different thing when I teach them how to use that tool. Get that? So let's learn, let's look at and, and let's understand how do we disciple? So how are disciples formed? So let's look at that scripture verse, and I wanted to, to key in some, some key phrases in our translation. So Matthew 28, 19 through 20 says, Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. So let's focus on that first word, go. The first thing we have to understand is it's not stay. <laughs> Staying here in your seats is not discipling. We have to do something. We have to go outside of our walls and we have to go to the people. If whether we look at that verb as a disciple as a verb or a noun, the, 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 the key uh, area to that that Jesus commanded is that we go to all nations. We go to all people. We go to people that aren't like us. We go to people that are like us. We go to everyone. And so the first part is we go. The second part is we make. Here's a problem with the church. When we, when we got to this mindset of you build it, they'll come, we figured disciples would just naturally grow and come to the church. But no, you make disciples. Disciples are not found. Jesus didn't go, oh, look, there's James, there's John. They look like pretty proper, holy people. I'll just grab them because they know everything they need to know about following me and they'll follow me. No, Jesus had to teach them. Jesus had to show them. Jesus had to go out to them and bring them. And that's what we've got to do. So we got to go. We got to make. <laughs> Baptizing. Now, Baptizing, that, that was more than just what Jesus, when Jesus asked, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. I want to I I hit some key elements that I feel is crucial in our understanding that I'm at this church about baptism. Discipleship starts at the beginning. And baptism is also one of the ways that God um, initiates covenant with us. Baptism is... A sign that God has chosen us. Baptism is a door. And baptism is also the beginning. And not the end. You know, a lot of, uh, a lot of our, our brothers and sisters denominations, they, they look at baptism as, hey, if, how many people can we get baptized? Good, we're done with them. No. One of the reasons we baptize younger children is because we know that they're going to be raised by the church. They're going to be raised through the power of the Holy Spirit, that the Holy Spirit is going to be active in their lives, and so are we. And so when we look at that word baptizing, that means we are committed to bringing each other up, not just into the church, but in the church, and as they go on to other places. We're committed to that. Baptism is more than just an initiation. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, a church body That we say with God, God, we see the mighty work you're doing in the, this person's life, and we are going to join you in that work. And we commit to that. You know, I love baptisms because whenever we baptize a child, you have, and, you, and we, we say the, the, all the, 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 the words we say, one of the things you say as a body is that you basically commit that you'll be at that, that child's VBS. You'll be their Sunday school teacher. You'll be their youth uh, volunteer. You'll be sending them packages when they go off to college. And you'll welcome them back when they're home on vacation. 
that you've committed to be active in their life as the church community. And that's one of the beautiful parts about baptism. As we say those things. Now there's a lot more that baptism means, but, but if we can understand that it's the beginning and not the end, it reminds us that we're involved in that process. The Holy Spirit is the key element, but we're involved in that as well. And then the last word I want us to see there is teaching them to obey everything that I've commanded you. See, disciples got to be taught. You know, I, I think the church is very difficult sometimes on people. We expect them to know or be. We expect them to act or say. But a lot of times, they come from backgrounds, and people come from backgrounds, they have no clue of our traditions or our history. They have no clue of, of where we come from or what we've done. And we have to teach them these things. And when we go, when our, our children go off to school this next week or a couple weeks, and they go into these classrooms, a horrible teacher would be angry at them for not knowing what they should know. A good teacher understands that. And grows with them and, and encourages them to learn new things and to grow in their wisdom. And we need to be the same sort of people. So we know how discipleship is going to happen. It's going to happen by us going. It's going to happen by us making. It's going to happen by us baptizing. And it's going to happen by us teaching. But why should we disciple? Why should we do it in the first place? See, knowing what our how, or knowing our what and how about discipleship is important, but I believe we also need to take another step back and rediscover our why. If you were asked why you're here at this church, what would your response be? So we're going to do a little exercise, okay? I'm going to ask you to stand if this represents you. Now I know you some of you are like, Chuck, you make us stand up all the time and sit down and sit down. Be with me for a second. <laughs> First group of people that I want to stand, and there's a lot of in this, but I want you to stand if this represents you. It, it, here, the whole this out. If this at all speaks to you, I was born in the Methodist Church, or I have I have sought after Methodist churches, or maybe I was raised in the Methodist Church, or as the case may be, I was a member of one of the former churches that this one merged into. But the Methodist Church has basically been my life. If that represents you, for, for the most part, please stand up. Okay. All right, so look around. This, that's what our church consists of right now. All right, you can sit down. <laughs> if I was never a Methodist, but I was invited by someone to this church, please stand up. Okay, look around. All right, please sit down. And the last one. I was never a Methodist. I found this church on my own. Please stand up. Okay. All right, please sit down. Now, the, the numbers here are actually not so bad, but what we've discovered in the Methodist church is that first group represents 80% or more of United Methodist churches. Meaning United Methodist churches are populated with people that have always been Methodist, that were born Methodist, that were raised Methodist. That's what they were born, that, that's just, that's life to them. 80% or more. That second group, those that were invited to the church, represent about 10 to 15%. I mean, I'm sorry, five to 10%, I'm sorry. Of people that say, I was never Methodist. I was invited by someone to this church. And then that last group, less than 5% was, I was never Methodist. I found this church on my own. So here's what I want us to see first off in this. Why do we need discipleship? Because that's less than 5%. If we want to grow this church, less than 5% are just going to stumble through our door. Less than 5%. We can't just expect people just to walk in. It's low numbers. As a matter of fact, when I was reading a lot of these places, a lot of churches are right near half a percent to one percent of their, of their population. That's probably general for most churches in, 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 at all because people just don't 
stumble in your church. It's very few. But the next group, I was never Methodist. I was invited by someone to the church. Is five to ten percent. Now your very large United Methodist churches do have a significant number of that first group. But the growing ones, like First United Methodist Church of McKinney, like Church of the Resurrection, like various churches, Methodist churches that are known for growing and making disciples right now, they're seeing that number of, I was never Methodist, I was invited by someone to this church, growing to about 25 to 30 percent of their congregation. That's why we disciple. That's why we disciple. Because if we're going to grow as United Methodist Church, we can't just keep plugging in that 80% or more because guess what? That 80% or more across the nation is what? It's decreasing. So the reason the United Methodist Church is decreasing is because that's where we live and nurturing that 80% or more. But if, the, if we're going to grow, it's because we're going to be people who invite and reach out and go make disciples, baptizing them and teaching them. See, it's my claim that the many United Methodists have, have lost or forgotten their why for being a disciple. For being in a particular church. And thus, we have forgotten or lost the why of making disciples. We have sought to bring clarity to what a disciple is, how a disciple is formed. But the most important thing for us to do next, and we're, gonna, we're really going to dive into this next week, is the most important thing for us to do next is to reconnect with our why. Because those 80% that stood up for, for, for a little bit while ago, I know you love this church. For many of you, I know you love the United Methodist Church. But reconnect with your why. And you can help others find their why for being here. So homework. I got it. I want you to go and email me this. It's in your bulletin. I'm going to also put, place it on our website, just like I did last time. I want you to send me these answers. Why am I here in this church? What brought me here? Why do I stay? What keeps me here? And why is this place so important to me? Because here's what I believe. I believe if we can come to an understanding of this in our own hearts... Our hearts reach our mind and reach our mouth. And we start sharing with others. Why? Let us pray. Almighty God, I pray we become people of the mission, people of the purpose. That we go out and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching to them to obey your commandments. Because this is what you've called us to. It's in your son Jesus' name we pray.